So our next session is um, around collective agency in evolution and AI. And this session will be moderated by David Walsh, um, Dennis Walsh. Dennis is a, a philosopher of biology in the Department of Philosophy, uh, the Institute of, for History and, and Philosophy of Science and Technology and the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Toronto. So there's a, there's a number of places in which David, Dennis is engaging here. Uh, Dennis's research interests revolve around the interpretation of evolutionary theory and the nature of scientific explanation. He investigates the nature of living things and their place in evolutionary biology. He is currently a co-principal investigator on a collaborative project with evolutionary biologist entitled Agency in Living Systems. Dennis is also a research lead at the schwartz riesman Institute for Technology and Society. Dennis, over to you. Uh, thank you, Monique. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, <clears throat> so, um, as Monique said, we are. This session is dedicated to trying to get an understanding of the kind of scope for reciprocal illumination between the disciplines of AI and evolutionary theory. So, in particular, we will address questions about collective agency. Um, so, uh, the questions will be. How can our study of multi-agent AI uh, inform our study of theoretical evolutionary biology? And in, in the reverse, how can our study of, of uh, multi-agent evolutionary biology inform um, uh, collective AI? So as you can see, this is um, uh, extravagantly uh, interdisciplinary. So we're really, really grateful to have two wonderful speakers to guide us through this. They are Kate Larson and Richard Watson. So I'll introduce them both first and then I'll turn it over to them. So we'll start with Kate Larson. And uh, Kate is a professor in the Territon School of Computer Science at the University of Waterloo. She's affiliated with the AI group there and she holds a university research chair uh, and the Pasupalak AI Fellowship. Did I say that right, Kate? <laughs> so her... Um, uh, her work focuses on the interaction of self-interested agents and how computer uh, computational limitations influence strategic behavior in multi-agent systems, among other things. Richard Watson is a newly minted full professor at the uh, University of Southampton School of Electronics uh, and, the com and Computer Science. He also has a background in theoretical evolutionary biology uh, his current research seeks to deepen our understanding of biological evolution by expanding the formal equivalence of learning and evolution, in particular using connectionist models of cognition and learning. So as you can see, despite the fact that we're coming from two quite radically different disciplines, there is scope for lots of uh, fruitful overlap and interaction here. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Kate. And then Kate, uh, uh, Rich will take over from when you're finished. Okay, thanks very much and take it away. Okay, great. So I guess I'll start off by sharing my slides. It's always worked smoothly. So we'll hopefully it will work today too. Okay, right. So thank you very much for the introduction. And I've been really looking forward to this session um, that I will admit, I'm not too sure what to expect. Um, I guess about a month ago, we had our, our brainstorming uh, session where we were trying to figure out kind of what, what central problem are we both interested in? And, you know, we decided that this idea of collective agency and cooperation among agents is something that we both, both care about very much and have spent some time thinking about it. And so we landed on, among other things, one of the questions being, when is a collection of agents a collective agent? And I will admit that my initial very, very flippant response was, why is this even a question? I, as an AI researcher who likes to think about and engineer multi-agent systems, gets to design everything. My collection of agents are, of course, collective agent, you know, of, of course, exhibit collective agency. But thinking about it, um, you know, you know, a little bit deeper, I think we, we actually began. I actually began, you know, lots and lots of questions began to, to arise. I think of myself as engineering systems, but we have this, you know, we're in order to support cooperation, but it's not always clear that the questions or the objectives or the way that I'm designing, designing the, or the agents that I work with or think about 
are, is, is it, that's the right way of actually doing this. And so what I'm hoping to learn um, about today is what ideas from sort of evolution and co of, of cooperation and collective agency from natural agents can we actually use to better design or to better ask questions about sort of um, scenarios where we have these artificial agents. Now, the way that I have structured my, my presentation today is first to kind of give you an idea as to from what perspective I'm coming from, because that's obviously going to then illuminate kind of why I ask particular questions. And then I decided just to highlight three definitions of sort of collections of agents that are well studied inside the artificial intelligence and multi-agent systems community, sort of highlighting kind of why we find these, these particular models sort of interesting, and also where I think there is potential to learn from more from the uh, evolutionary biologists as to what questions that we should be asking or how should we reconsider the way that um, we should be designing these systems in the first place. So a little bit of background. Um, I am a, you know, a computer scientist. Uh, my background is in artificial intelligence with a particular focus on multi-agent systems. I am broadly interested in understanding how and when can we get agents, where an agent, I, I mean a decision maker, this might be a, an artificial like AI agent or it could be people, to coordinate and cooperate. So in particular, I'm very much interested in environments where we have sort of interactions between these different entities. Now, given a set of agents, I'm curious about, you know, we have a group. I want to understand kind of how can we either from an outside perspective kind of make the right decision on behalf of that group or better yet sort of, you know, figure out kind of how the group itself could be making kind of appropriate decisions that reflects sort of the preferences and values of the, of the uh, group members themselves. I spend a lot of time worrying about strategic behavior and, um, that can arise in different settings, particularly kind of what sort of um, AI um, approaches could be used to ensure that agents kind of understand the intentions and actions of different agents with a particular focus on how does computation and information limitations affect their strategic reasoning. And then finally, I have, we have a long interest in um, sort of design as I've already had highlighted, almost sort of an engineering perspective where we ask questions about, well, how do we design these systems and what sort of institutional structure do we need to um, put in place so that we can support kind of good group behavior for different um, definitions of uh, groups or collectives of agents. Inside this space, my work um, ranges from the highly theoretical to the applied. So I, my students and I prove theorems about trying to understand how uncertainty about other members of, uh, you know, other, other agents in the group might affect kind of the quality of outcomes that might arise in different interactions. I collaborate quite closely with colleagues who do human computer interaction, trying to bring some of these ideas into practice um, to understand how we can better support groups of people working together. And then I have a number of also works of a number of sort of very applied work where often we're looking at sort of resource allocation or group decision making in complex um, domains such as combating wildfires. Now, Again, I want to emphasize that I'm coming from a back from an, an AI background, particular focus on decision making and in multi-agent systems. And one thing which I think is really important to understand is what do I mean when I talk about an agent, or what are the sorts of agents I tend to be um, worried about? And these agents often have a, a fairly high level of sophistication. Um, we assume that they're decision, make, decision makers and they are interacting with some environment where that environment can include and almost certainly does include other agents. But these agents can be able to sort of perceive things in the environment, they can take actions and change the environment. They Sometimes they are learning. So some of my work does involve reinforcement learning. So they are exploring in the environment and getting rewards. And then I try to understand sort of given kind of these alternative models, kind of what sort of outcomes are going to arise and can we um, make sure that we are supporting these agents sort of in the correct way and how can we leverage kind of the group. Now 
as I had said in my, you know, as in my introduction, so this idea about when is a collection of agents a collective agent, you know, kind of took me took me uh, took me aback. I thought, well, a collection of agents who are collectively acting, of course, is a collective agent. Um, but what does that mean in terms of AI models? Um, and so what I'm going to do in my like the rest of my time is sort of go through three models that are well studied inside the AI literature and the multi-agent systems literature, which I think kind of highlight this idea of a, a collective agent at, you know, at different levels. The first one will be sort of Minsky Society of Minds. I'll then talk a little bit about coalitions and models that have been um, inspired from the cooperative game theory literature, and then we'll end with a little bit of work that we've been doing on teams. And again, I'm not going to go into much detail, or particularly not very much technical detail on either of these ideas, but I'm going to hope to try to highlight kind of ish questions that I have that I'm hoping that insight from natural agents will um, be able to address, or at least sort of um, sort of refine kind of some of the questions that we ask in this space. So the first, you know, when I first think about you know, sort of a, a collective agency. Um, I think one of the very compelling models that sort of matches that idea is sort of Marvin Minsky's idea about the society of minds. So this was sort of a hypothesis that he um, deposited in, um, this, in his book, his 1988 book, which is sort of a series of essays kind of exploring the idea. And his argument was that when we think about sort of behavior, I guess, could be human behavior, but more likely kind of agent behavior, it really should not be thought of a, as a result of a single cognitive agent. But instead, what we probably have is, or what one way of thinking about it is that it's a society, so it's a collection of um, simpler agents who are kind of interacting with each other. You see, are called these processes. And what's quite compelling about this idea is that you, what you have is a co collection of relatively simple agents who are different, they can have sort of different purposes, they have different, maybe different ways of learning, they have different ways of representing knowledge, producing results, and so on and so forth. But this whole, this, this sort of collaborative group sort of gives rise to sort of more complex behaviors. Now, this, I, this idea as positive by Minsky was kind of like a hypothesis that maybe this is one way that we could design intelligent agents. And it has been incorporated into a number, into a number of models. Right, so examples of models of along the Spain include sort of the Horde architecture by Sutton et al. It also has sort of um, relationships to some of the ideas about height and hierarch that appear in hierarchical reinforcement learning, as well as things like the separation of concerns model um, that was relatively recently uh, proposed by Danseya et al. And I'm just going to give an a, a little bit of an example of the separations of concerns model, just sort of to highlight some of some of the aspects and also sort of um, some ideas, some, you know, places where, um, you know, some additional insight might be useful. So the separation of concerns model, and also very similar to actually the Horde architecture, what we have is like this idea of a single agent. But inside that single agent, we actually have a bunch of sub agents um, who are acting in the environment receiving rewards um, and learning kind of um, different different policies. What, however, what's interesting about all these different sub agents is that they have their own reward functions, they have their own goals. And so the policies that they are learning and potentially in how they're exploring the environment is different from kind of our central agent, the one that we actually care about, care about what policy it's learning. And what these, in these smaller agents do is that they allow us to, you know, if appropriately set up, to, you know, divide the environment into different into different areas, or sort of break down kind of this sort of this very complex space into sort of smaller subproblems. And then, of course, sort of the technical questions sort of involve: well, you have all these smaller, simpler agents kind of learning. Can they come up with cohesive policies to actually drive the behavior of your central agent that you actually care about? Now, one issue, so I find this idea really compelling, this idea that potentially there's possibility that we can use sort of simple learners in order to come up with quite complex policies for um, sort of a more 
you know, in complicated worlds. But there is sort of one downside that I see in some of these models. These models, in order to get them to work, have to be carefully engineered. And so I think this opens up sort of a bunch of interesting questions. So could, for example, evolutionary biology or research into sort of natural agents provide us with some insights as to um, how we should best organize these systems? Um, you know, right now we will sort of engineer the, the decomposition of the problem into these different agents, but maybe there's some way where this decomposition can arise naturally. What happens if the agents are evolving? So I think there's sort of lots of insight that could we might be able to um, to take in order to sort of better design sort of these systems in the first place. The second model um, that I wanted to quickly touch on in terms of collective agency is coalitions in sort of multi-agent systems. Now, this has the idea of a coalition, which is simply a collection of agents, ideally working together, um, has been one of the central problems that have been studied since sort of the advent of the subfield of multi-agent systems. So we have literature going back, well, certainly very active in the early 1990s and even before then. Now, what is a coalition? Well, if you have a set of agents, a coalition is simply a, a subset of them. Um, who ideally are going to work together. So these, it's a sort of an abstract idea. These agents, depending on the scenario that you find yourself in, could be fully cooperative and inclined to cooperate with each other inside the coalition, or they could be self-interested. And so you might have to worry about the incentives that agents have in order to stay inside a coalition. The argument is that by working together in their coalition and coordinating their actions, this is going to bring some benefit to the system overall, as well as hopefully to the individual agents themselves. Okay. And the, the core assumption here, of course, is that if we have a coalition of agents, you know, this group, then they are going to coordinate, cooperate internally. So we have sort of by definition, kind of this, you know, collective agent. Now, inside this space, there are really two overarching questions. The first one is, well, which coalitions should form? This is defined by the thing called the coalition of structure generation problem, um, which I'm going to talk about in my next slide. And then the second question is, why should these coalitions form? In particular, what incentives are there for these agents to actually you know, join with others in order to cooperate or coordinate their actions? So, a lot of work, again, going back to the 1990s, has looked at this coalition structure generation problem. This idea is that we have a bunch of agents. For some reason, if they work together or they coordinate their actions, it is, it is better, right? There's, there's a variety of reasons. Maybe they have different information that they can share. Maybe they have um, compatible skills. And so they can accomplish more tasks. It'll depend very much on kind of what your underlying application is. But the coalition structure generation problem is this abstract problem which says, okay, if I have a bunch of agents with either different properties, different attributes, different features, different skills, how can I organize them into these subgroups so that something good happens? So in particular, what we often want to do is that we'll have, we want to maximize social welfare. So we'll have some notion of underlying kind of system reward. And we're looking for sort of the best way to organize these agents so that this system reward or this welfare is optimized. Now, a lot of the literature in this space has taken a centralized approach. So what you do is that you sort of lay out your entire, you know, all possible ways agents could, could organize into sort of this lattice, and then you define it as a search problem. You know, simply we're going to search through this space and we're going to find the optimal coalition structure. There's been a lot of work which sort of, you know, looks at ways to provide sort of theoretical guarantees as the outcome of a search, as well as different ways of leveraging under um, different underlying structure that might arise in the agent's models themselves. What is less, uh, which has been explored to a lesser extent, are the decentralized approaches, um, which is, I think, have an interesting problem where I'm hoping to be able to get some, some insight from evolutionary approaches. So in particular, the decentralized approach 
the question is, well, can agents self-organize themselves into good coalition structures? Um, this allows for more dynamicism in the problem as opposed to centralized approaches where you kind of just take like sort of a fixed instance and are trying to solve an optimization problem. But a centralized approach might allow for the agents to learn about whether they're compatible or not with, um, with different subsets of agents. And it would be very interesting to understand how we might be able to better pose this as a, as a, you know, as a problem, as well as sort of what objectives we should be trying to achieve if we look at sort of more decentralized approaches. The second question that arises in the literature on um, when we talk about coalitions and multi-agent systems is sort of the why question. So why should agents actually decide to cooperate with others in a coalition? And this takes over a very strong focus on incentives. So trying to understand kind of what are the underlying incentives that should be in place or need to be in place in order for agents to work with others inside a group, inside a coalition. Now, this line of research, again, has been very active inside the research community and has had a strong focus on using and adopting ideas from cooperative game theory. So for example, we spend a lot of time thinking about sort of solution concepts like the core, the Shapley value, and trying to understand when these solution concepts sort of make sense and can be used in practice for, in various um, sort of coalitional um, um, scenarios. What's nice about these solution concepts is that they tend to be axiomatic in nature. And so, you know, it's a matter of checking whether certain properties hold or not. Right. And they allow us then to ask to answer questions about, like, for example, under what conditions will agents act as a collective? And when will these collectives actually be effective and stable? Or when are they going to sort of collapse on us? But I think one interesting or several interesting questions begin to arise. Well, first, if we think about our agents learning over time, um, but also are these solution concepts that we have relied on for the last couple of decades really the right ones? Are they, are they um, providing kind of the right objective functions that we should be considering when we um, begin to design our systems? I'll talk a little bit about some work that I had done um, with a, a graduate student of mine, where we had been looking at sort of groups of actually, in this case, it was people, um, and trying to see you know, how can we best support them to working together, and particularly how should we reward them for working effectively as a group. And in one of our studies, we showed that the way that we divide sort of reward sort of matters very, very much, and that. Um, people were very, very sensitive to sort of perceived fairness or unfairness in the, in the way that rewards were shared for, for work in a group. But then when we asked, went back, we sort of asked the question, well, if you care about fairness, what would the fair payments be? What we found is that there was actually a disconnect between what people, or I guess we can call them agents, reported as fair as opposed to some of the axiomatic um, notions. So for example, there was a disagreement between kind of how, what humans thought were fair, if they were working in a group, versus what something like the Shapley value would tell them that they should be, would, should be fair. Um, what we also found was interesting was that the, our human data was highly structured in that there was sort of consistent properties that people found interesting, considered to be fair, but it was just not lining up well with some of these axiomatic uh, methods from the the, the cooperative game theory literature. And so this, I think, also gives rise to a number of really, really interesting questions. Um, you know, if our agents are learning or they're evolving over time towards sort of these cooperative structures, then what solution concepts, um, or for example, you know, payment or rewards that they would like to get for sort of cooperating be the appropriate ones? Are they going to eventually converge to situations where some of these axiomatic definitions you know, align properly with, the, with um, sort of what these groups um, think are fair, for example? Or are there other solution concepts that we should be exploring and we should be defining to better capture kind of the, the norms that might arise um, if, if we're working, when we talk about sort of natural agents? And then how can that sort of define um, the way that we design our multi-agent systems of artificial agents?
Now, the last thing I wanted to touch on very quickly, because I am aware of the time, is teams. So teams are another way of supporting cooperation. So a team is simply a collection of agents, so very much like a, like a coalition, except that we say that if you're a team member, then you care about the team. And they sort of form as a middle ground between kind of fully cooperative settings and groups of agents acting individually. With uh, some of my graduate students who have been exploring the idea of, um, of teams and um, in particular, can agents learn to become a good team, become good team members? And what we have been able to show is that actually sort of, you know, medium-sized teams are actually surprisingly effective. So we've taken sort of complex social dilemmas um, and divided our agents up into, our learning agents up into teams and are able to show that, you know, that if you have sort of medium-sized teams, these agents learn faster, they learn how to cooperate, they learn faster, and they learn how to specialize, resulting in sort of um, significantly higher um, sort of mean population reward compared obviously to cases where all agents are acting as individuals, but even the situation where we have a fully cooperative setting. So if we believe that teams are effective for learning agents, we don't, what we don't hunt, you know, which, which we believe is true. I mean, our, our experiments seem to show this across a variety of different domains, but what we don't necessarily understand is under what conditions are teams effective? Are these, sort of, are these smaller cooper cooperating subgroups actually kind of doing the right thing? So questions like, well, how large should a team be? Can agents learn to form teams? I think are interesting questions that right now I don't have any, um, I don't have any, any good answers, but I have a suspicion that there are, that there are insights from other fields that will be able to help us sort of answer these questions as well, for, you know, formulate what questions we should be asking. So to conclude, um, what I've done very quickly is sort of highlighted kind of three examples of collective agency that, we've, that have been well studied inside the AI multi-agent systems literature. And again, this is certainly not an exhaustive list. I've also attempted to highlight some issues where hopefully kind of this evolution of collective agency and natural agents can teach us about the design of artificial agents. And I guess insights that I would love to, um, to get are as we design our artificial agents and our systems for supporting artificial agents, are we asking the right questions in the first place? And if not, what questions should we be asking? Often we formulate our problems as optimization problems, so some underlying kind of objective function that we're trying to optimize. Are, you know, are these the right objectives in the first place? And how, finally, how do we move away from these highly, some of these really highly centralized approaches, even though they we're talking about multiple agents, um, to sort of a more decentralized approach? In particular, would that then kind of reduce kind of the, the engineering burden that um, arises as we try to design these design these um, systems in practice. Okay, and so I'm going to stop sharing at this point. Uh, thank you, Kate. That's wonderful. I'm um, I'm sure there are lots and lots of questions, but it also sounds like you have lots of questions for Richard. So I suggest we go straight through to Richard, and then we put the two together and have a discussion about what has emerged. Okay, over to you, Richard, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dennis, and thank you very much, Kate, for uh, presenting such a clearly structured and, and, and illuminating material there, because for me, I do see lots of connections there. I definitely won't be able to answer all of your questions, but I'll try to do some justice to those connections. I'm not sure if I'll be able to live up to that, but I'll see if I can. So I study what you might call uh, collective agency in the context of evolution by natural selection. And if I can get my slides to advance, here's an overview of where I'm gonna go. First of all, I'm gonna make the point that in biology, individuality is a mess. I mean, there are some canonical organisms that we think it's very straightforward, but it really isn't. Um, I want to argue for the case that evolution really is about individuality and not just something that you can take for granted. Talk about the paradox of individuality. Um, 
namely how individuality can create itself and uh, come to the question of when is a collection of individuals a collective individual or when is a collection of agents a collective agent that Kate talked about there and I'll talk about some formal conditions and necessary machinery that to move towards that some next steps uh, but I think that it might be um, appropriate to reflect upon how Kate started there to say that it's obvious when we're um, designing an artificial collective multi-agent system that we can design it to have agency at the system level. We know it has agency at the system level because I designed it to have that. But there's uh, also a desire, of course, in artificial multi-agent systems that you want to have properties like distributed control based on local information and perhaps a separation of concerns. That's why you were doing collective agency and not just building an agent. And perhaps those are the sorts of things that you want because you wanted scalability or something like that, that you're gonna just add more agents to it and it gets smarter or better or larger. And there's a question there about whether the independence of the parts that you want for the scalability is directly opposed to the collective agency of the whole, that to the extent that they're independent, it isn't a collective agent, it's just a collection of agents. And that's, uh, that's a similar tension that runs throughout this topic in the evolutionary biology too. Uh, I think that a, a point of contrast that might be worth um, mentioning though, is that we, in multi-agent systems, it's common to start with agents that are already very complicated. And we can make them as complicated as we like, and we can make lots of them and see what they do together. Whereas in evolutionary biology, or at least in theoretical evolutionary biology, in thinking about these questions, we often start with agents which are as simple as possible. And the question is about how can you get them to do something collectively that they didn't do individually? And what does it mean to do that? And when are they a collective individual or not? even though um, the components were themselves relatively simple. So there might be some contrasts in what's useful there, but let's see what we can make of it. So I want to start by um, asserting that the truly surprising thing about evolution is not how it makes individuals better adapted to their environment, but how it makes individuals. Uh, in Biology, we sometimes take individual individuality for granted. You know, here's an individual multicellular organism. And we know that there are sometimes some other levels of organization like single-celled organisms or perhaps individual self-replicating molecules that have some credibility as an evolutionary unit. But there are different levels of individuality there, but there are also plenty of cases where the individuality is not so clear the eusocial insects that are arguably superorganisms, which doesn't just apply to insects, but also to some kinds of mammals that have a queen. There's the single celled organisms like bacteria that sometimes form three dimensional structures that really look like multicellular organisms, but aren't. Uh, there's at the other extreme, there are things that look like multicellular organisms, but are actually just a single cell. This is a meter long algae that only has one cell. And then there's organisms that spend part of their life cycle that look like a multicellular organism and part of their life cycle that looks like single celled organisms. And there are the aspen grove, which looks like a forest of multiple trees, but underneath the soil, all of the roots show that they were really just ramets of one organism. So is it one organism or is it many? There are multicellular organisms that certainly behave uh, in a way that has sort of unity of purpose, uh, but uh, it turns out that if you cut one of these in half, both halves will grow the missing part, the head will grow the tail, uh, but also the tail will regrow a new head and the record is you can cut it into 273 different pieces and all of the pieces will become fully functioning worms. And there's macaques. Well, they look pretty straightforward, but they're weird. Uh, on a cellular level, they are genetic chimera of two different fertilized eggs. Well, these are all very interesting, Richard, but they're very weird. It doesn't, these sort of ambiguities and weirdnesses don't apply to regular multicellular organisms like you or I or this geranium, but actually that's not the case either because all eukaryotes, animals, plants, and fungi have a symbiogenetic origin, which says actually a, originates from a symbiosis between a host cell and various different kinds of bacteria, which Margulis describes as follows. 
different bacteria form consortia that under ecological pressures associate and undergo metabolic and genetic change such that their tightly integrated communities result in individuality at a more complex level of organization. And Maynard Smith and Zathmary described this as one of many different transitions in the scale of biological organization. And although the details of each of those transitions and what happens and how they work and what kind of things are involved are different at those different levels of organization or transitions in individuality, as they're sometimes called, they do have a common property that entities that were capable of independent replication before the transition can replicate only as part of a larger whole after the transition. And the general scheme is then that we start off with solitary individuals at one level of organization, and they uh, evolve to form cooperative groups, which is not so unusual. But then something slightly mysterious happens, that the group gets transformed into a new level of individuality, more about what's mysterious about that in a minute. Uh, and then as we zoom out, uh, those individuals are initially solitary, but then participate in forming cooperative groups, which then transform into a new level of individuality, and so on, and so on. And these might correspond to various different kinds of scales of uh, biological complexity in the natural world. But if it's true that in these transitions, entities that were capable of independent replication before the transition can replicate only as part of a larger whole after the transition, then this is a little bit weird because what's the motivation for cooperating with one another before the transition? Well, before the transition, there's only one evolutionary unit, right? It's the individual units. So their motivation for cooperating must be because it was in their self-interest. It was in the self-interest of the parts to cooperate with one another, perhaps because they bring mutual benefit. But after the transition in becoming a new evolutionary unit at a higher level of organization, those parts give up the most fundamental aspect of their Darwinian process, their ability to reproduce individually and have their own fitness. Before the transition, uh, adaptation by natural selection served the survival and reproduction of the parts. But after the transition, adaptation by natural selection serves the survival and reproduction of the whole, even when that conflicts with the interests of the parts, as in the germ cells might make it to the next generation, but the somatic cells don't. So in biology, individuality is highly ambiguous, and more to the point, it's not fixed. It's not just an argument about which level shall we call the individual, but whatever level you're going to call it, it's not going to stay like that. Because all individuals are made of parts that used to be individuals themselves. I'm in a computer science department, so everybody's on the spectrum a bit, but the PhD student I have that's a bit further out than the others really doesn't like that statement because he points out that it's a recursive statement without a stopping clause, but I'm prepared to live with it. So transitions in individuality are not just a weird thing a sort of esoteric higher order conundrum within evolutionary biology, they are the fundamental process of creative adaptation in biology. Uh, it's, you know, the difference between a quadruped with a long neck and a quadruped with a short neck is just details, but the difference between a multicellular organism that behaves as though it's one thing and a collection of cells or a population of cells that's just not that's the fundamental process of creative adaptation in biology. And the multi-scale autonomy that we see that persists in uh, multicellular organisms, for example, is vital to the stability and resilience and evolvability of the biological complexity that we see in the natural world. So social evolution theory uh, is poorly equipped. So social evolution theory is about the evolution of social behavior, cooperation, for example, but it's poorly equipped to explain transitions in individuality for a number of reasons. Firstly, um, if you're trying to explain individuality by the fact that, well, the individuals all have the same genes and that's why they were cooperating with one another, then you need to know that not all transitions in individuality involve components that have high genetic homogeneity. So in the origin of chromosomes from independent self-replicating molecules, those independent self-replicating molecules are different from each other. They're not genetically related. They're definitely not genetically identical. And in the origin of eukaryote cells through the symbiosis of the host cell 
and the uh, cyanobacteria that became the organelle, they were not genetically uh, related either, even though they did become a new reproductive entity. Also, acting with unity of purpose in a multicellular organism doesn't require genetic homogeneity, as I mentioned for those flatworms earlier, or the macaques. A bigger problem, there's more, is that social evolution theory only explains the cooperation that you would expect given a certain interaction structure. An interaction structure determines who meets who, who's playing a game with who, uh, whether those, in particular, whether those individuals are related to one another. If individuals meet other individuals that are closely related to them, their kin, then social evolution theory predicts that the level of cooperation would be high. And if it's not their kin, then it doesn't. But what social evolution theory doesn't do is explain changes in interaction structures, such that they, who interacted with who and how often is, a, is an exogenous parameter to social evolution theory, and it needs to be endogenized so that we can use it to explain why the level of individuality changed. But perhaps an even bigger problem is that the genetic definition of individuality doesn't even see the individual let alone the transition in individuality. It doesn't attempt, it doesn't explain or attempt to explain the organization of the parts in their relationships with one another. It doesn't see the organism at all. And it fails there, but therefore to address all of the questions that are really interesting about individuality, not least how individuality changes from one level of organization to another. So the paradox of individuality within the framework of natural selection is about what level of natural selection is going to explain the transition in individuality. The selection on lower level units can't explain a transition in individuality because giving up individuality in order to become part of a higher level unit is antithetical to selection. It's if you like, dissolving the self that was self-interested in order to become just a part of a self at a higher level of organization. And selection on the higher level units also can't explain it because the organization necessary to affect the higher level unit doesn't exist until after the transition. I think they developed the right organization of relationships with one another in this way so that they could create a higher level unit would presuppose the higher level unit that you were trying to explain what Dennett would call a skyhook. Uh, suffice to say, lots of books written on transitions and in individuality, mostly by philosophers because they're not afraid to tackle the hard questions. And we don't know how to explain transitions and in individuality. So I'm afraid that if you were hoping that the evolutionary biologists, certainly so much as I can represent them, would give you answers about how to do that, uh, we haven't got it. So evolutionary transitions and in individuality are not just about putting things into new containers for selection to act on, which would be a group selection way of thinking. You've you know, I had these things and they were individuals, and then I put them underneath the cell membrane altogether. I put them underneath the skin of a multicellular organism, and now they get selected on as a group. Nor is it explained by or just about relatedness or kin selection of the genetic homogeneity, as I mentioned a couple of slides ago. A transition in individuality is driven by a change in the nature of the relationships between things, because a new level of selection, a new evolutionary unit is the product, not the cause. It's not we have a new level of selection and that explains why things were cooperating. These things were cooperating and they created a new level of selection. It's a, to say that the higher level selection explains the cooperation is confusing the thing that needs to be explained with the mechanism that explains it. So let's think about the nature of the relationships between the components. Before the transition, self-interested individuals form relationships to serve their own interests. Uh, but after the transition, relationships are organized to serve the interests of the whole, such that multiple short-sighted self-interested entities, natural selection is famously short-sighted, right? Organize their relationships with one another to create a new level of individuality, meaning that they're thereby caused uh, by those relationships to act in a manner that's consistent with long-term collective interest. So that raises at least a couple of questions. What kind of relationships do you need and how do they need to be organized in order to get a new level of individuality. 
and what are the conditions that cause the relationships to become organized in such a manner. And this relates to Kate's questions about the coalitions or Kate's um, uh, informing us about those different aspects of coalition formation. One question is what coalitions should you have or what's the process by which you get, and the other question is what's the process by which you, by which you get those coalitions or relationships that create those coalitions. So um, when we're thinking about how do we know whether we've got the right kind of relationships and whether we've got a new level of individuality, is just saying that they're cooperating with one another enough. You could say, well, why did they do it? They did it because it was in their mutual benefit to do it. But if it was in the interest of each of the individual components to do it, well, that doesn't need any special explanation. It's the cases where it wasn't in their individual interest to do it that needs the special explanation. Now, well, those are called altruism, where I'm doing something that benefits you, but it's at a cost to me. So maybe if I see a group that includes altruistic individuals, I'm more inclined to say, well, that's an individual then. Maybe that's part of the story. But a higher level individual is more than just a group with a high frequency of cooperators or a high frequency of altruists. It really needs to be an organization that reinstates the Darwinian machine at a high level of organization. An evolutionary unit, a new one, must exhibit all of the necessary and sufficient conditions for evolution by natural selection to occur so that it can participate in the next evolutionary transition. Or at least if it doesn't, then it won't be able to participate in the next evolutionary transition. That means it has to exhibit variation or a repertoire of behaviors, if we were calling it an agent, selection or some kind of uh, ability to respond to reward and heritability, uh, some kind of uh, mechanism of passing on stuff that's learned or uh, memory. And in each case, the variability, selectability and heritability of the composite must be more than the sum of the variation, selection and heritability of the parts. Otherwise, it's just a sort of aggregate description of some parts and not really a thing. And it's not really a thing that has uh, caused an influence at the higher level of organization. But here's a bit of a problem. If collective character that, that higher level selection might act on is determined by the characters of the parts, right? It doesn't come from nowhere. The parts make, the parts do something together and they create some sort of collective thing. If that's the case, it doesn't come from nowhere, it comes from the parts. How can collective character and not particle character cause particle fitness? How can the reason that this particle does this behavior or chooses one behavior over another, how can that be explained by the collective and not by the particle, since it was the particle that created the collective character in the first place? So the first thing, the first sort of step in answering that question is to say that, well, it must be something to do with a non-additive or synergistic or non-linear relationship. So, when this particle does this behavior, it's good. But when multiple particles do that behavior, it's even better in a super linear sort of way. Perhaps it's the number of cooperators squared in just, instead of just the number of cooperators or some sort of nonlinear threshold effect. And in this way, we can say that individual selection might drive you towards having collectives that have more of that kind of individual in it, but you get more bang for your buck at the higher level of organization. That's a step in the right direction maybe, but it's really not enough because the direction of selection on the parts isn't altered by selection on the whole in these models because they're all monotonic functions. And if that's the case, then the selection on the collective character is explanatorily redundant because it doesn't alter evolutionary outcomes. What the individual does in order to maximize its own benefit is the same as what the individual does in order to maximize collective benefit. You just got a bit more of it than you were expecting. So in that case, the collective selection on the collective character can change that, oh, it evolves even more rapidly in that direction. It alters the rates, but it doesn't alter which things, which traits or which behaviors or which characteristics are favored and which ones aren't. In order to alter evolutionary outcomes, the collective character mustn't be just a nonlinear function of the particle characters, the, the characters of the parts. It needs to be a non-decomposable function of the particle characters. What does that mean? Well, in the additive case, 
uh, the fitness consequence of changing the behavior of one of the parts is the same regardless of what the other part is doing. In the synergistic case, the fitness consequence of changing the behavior of one of the parts has a different slope depending on what the other part is doing. But in the non-decomposable case, it doesn't just have a different slope, but the slope has a different sign. So the sign of the effect of the particle one character on collective fitness is reversed by the context of the particle two character. Okay, let's make this a little bit more concrete. A division of labor game will do. In a division of labor game, if you're playing strategy A, then me changing from A to B will increase collective fitness. But if you're playing strategy B, then me playing changing from a to B will decrease collective fitness because then we'd both be the same and we wouldn't solve the division of labor game. Instead, I need to do the opposite thing. When you're a B, I need to change from a B to an A in order to increase collective fitness so that then there'll be one of each in order to solve the division of labor game. So a division of labor game is not just, it's not just a synergistic function. It's a non-decomposable function that's vital for two players with two strategies. It's the only one that has the right properties. Uh, it has the right properties for exactly the same reason that XOR is the hello world of machine learning, right? The collective character is a non-linearly separable function of the particle characters. That's the only one where you have this thing that can't be done by a perceptron, right? Okay, so you need to have relationships that solve, uh, that create non-decomposable functions of that kind. Now, how do we explain the revolution? As mentioned, we can't presuppose the higher level selective unit in order to explain the selective pressures that produce the transition in individuality. The relationships between the components uh, need to be um, explained by bottom-up selective pressures. So some steps forward in that are, what kind of particle do you need? To generate a collective phenotype that's a non-decomposable function of particle phenotypes, such as to solve a division of labor gain. The functional roles of the particles must be heterogeneous. They have to be different from each other. But to avoid selection on the particles from distorting the frequencies of types, undermining the heritability of the collective character, the fitnesses of the particles need to be homogenous. They need to be the same. So the particles need to be different with respect to important aspects of function. Like you do this role and I'll do that role and we'll specialize so that we can do something together that we couldn't do individually. But the fact that I'm doing a different role from you can't have a different, make a difference to the reward that I get from it. Because if it did, that would mean I would take over and then I would ex competitively exclude you. So in order to solve that problem, particles need to be plastic. You have to separate function from fitness or behavior from reward if we were doing it in agent language. Either that's phenotypic plasticity or reproductive plasticity. And these correspond to two different types of transitions. The fraternal transition is, an, for example, the transition from single-celled organisms to multi-celled organisms, where the genotypes of all of the parts are the same, but the cells differentiate into different phenotypes during development. And in the egalitarian transitions, they're intrinsically different particles, like gene number one, gene number two, gene number three, they all do different things, they're heterogeneous, but their fitnesses are uh, controlled by having the reproductive behavior of the particles synchronized and controlled. Obviously, either one of those things, either the coordinated plasticity or the coordinated reproduction is gonna require some kind of communications between the parts, signals and responses. I need to see what it is that you did and then do the opposite and vice versa in order to control that plasticity. What kind of architecture is sufficient? Well, I mentioned that uh, the uh, X or logical XOR can't be solved by the perceptron. I think in this audience, we know what I'm talking about. You can't compute a nonlinearly separable function of its inputs with a single layer nonlinear function. You need intermediate subcalculations in order to be able to compute a nonlinear function, a nonlinearly separable function. And that means that there must be a, a deep structure, more, at least more than one layer, or a recurrent process that transforms the embryonic particles into an adult collective phenotype. And in biology, we call that process development. It needs a time scale that's extended over time and a life cycle that moves from undifferentiated particles to differentiated parts within a collective phenotype. In other words, imagine that we have agents which are sort of intrinsically the same, but before they are a collective agent, they need to develop in the sense of 
figuring out who's going to do what role. And that figuring out who's going to do what role, which role can't be just where well, you look at everybody in the side, because that would be a single layer perceptron sort of role. It needs to be, I don't know, well, I'll go this way a bit and we'll sort of figure out this and you go that way a bit and you sort of figure out that. And now I see, oh, now these guys see what those guys are doing in the next step. And the next step, you have a temporarily extended process of developing the collective Asian over time, and then it's ready to go. So you have a sort of a get ready phase where it isn't really doing anything, and then a go phase after it's organized the differentiation of functional rules. So to come back to that question of what can the evolution of collective agency and natural agents teach us about the design of artificial agents, I'll pitch it this way, that the notion of a fixed individual with incentives and parts just doesn't capture what an organism is in biology. A fixed individual with incentives that belong to that level of individuality and parts that don't have any incentives, they don't have any agency, they're just like parts of a machine. Treating organisms like that doesn't capture what's going on in biology. And perhaps that doesn't capture what we want from an artificial agent either. If we, if we Why are we doing collective multi-agent stuff in the first place, right? Why don't we just make one agent that does what we want? Uh, because to do so would be that the parts of that agent didn't have any autonomy of their own. They didn't have any agency of their own. And that's not what we wanted. And at the other extreme, we can give the parts autonomy, but then we're a little bit worried about whether the collective has it, right? There's, to the extent that they're doing their own thing, the collective isn't really a thing. It isn't really an agent, right? So if we uh, want an approach to agency that works in artificial agents, maybe we need to take a hint from the biology here that that notion of thinking about individuality as something that's fixed and doesn't change uh, might not work. And transitions in agency might be as fundamental to artificial agents as they are in natural systems. Last side. So simplistic notions of agent identity, such as, well, they're all in the same reward function, won't do for the same reason that, you know, they're all in the same selective unit won't do in biology. We need some way of transitioning from agents that are initially behaving with respect to short-term self-interest, but change through organizing their relationships with one another in order to serve long-term collective interest. And there's difficult bottom-up questions, difficult questions about how to do that in a bottom-up process because of things like the incentive to dissolve yourself and not presupposing the higher level individual you were trying to explain. And those questions are, uh, potent, I think, in the multi-agent domain as well. Um, in order to um, for reward to properly belong to the collective, or in biological terms, for fitness to properly belong to the collective, interactions must create collective phenotypes or collective behaviors that have that non-decomposable structure. Right? It can't just be, well, I'm foraging and you're foraging, and together we're multi-agent foraging is like no that's just a bunch of agents that are individually doing foraging right if you if you want that to have a behavior that's properly belonging to the collective it must have that non decomposable structure and that creates that problem of having well they need to do different things but they need to have all the same rewards uh, that requires them to have plasticity it's, it's it seems a strange thing to mention that you need to have plasticity because who would ever build an agent an artificial agent that didn't have a repertoire of more than one behavior. But in biology, it's necessary to say that because we often think of an agent as just a gene that doesn't do anything, but it does one thing only, and it doesn't have any plasticity. That's why it becomes important in the biology. Uh, and if you want a collective system to compute or create a collective phenotype that's more than the sum of the parts, then it needs a developmental process where the agents are figuring out what they're going to do um, before they do it. They can't have a sort of sustained uh, collective agency. It needs to have that sort of get ready, go, get ready, go, or push into the problem and then pull back and push into the problem and then pull back. So I don't know that I've been successful in explaining uh, why all of those con uh, connections that I'm claiming there uh, are, are valid, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to have a go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Kate. So I don't want to obtrude too much on the discussion period, but um, I was really struck by uh, Kate's description of uh, 
this um, system of um, multi-agent separation of concerns where each of the component agents and this collective agent sort of um, performed, had a small repertoire of activities and a, sim a small repertoire of goals that's uh, very much limited with respect to the range of, rep of activities and goals and capacities of the system as a whole. Because <clears throat> that sounded to me just like a perfect description of a multicellular organism or even a eukaryote. Right. And uh, then you ask, well, can evolutionary biology throw some insights on how to design these? So uh, I'm wondering if you think maybe Richard's given us a tentative answer that, okay, well, one thing we need, this architecture has to involve uh, the, the reward functions have to be a uh, decomposable function of the activities of the parts. They have to be, as it were, sensitive to one another, responsive in that way. Is that Does that get us anywhere towards a, a kind of... Um, uh, an, uh, understanding an architecture for these? Yeah, so I think so. And uh, some of these, these systems which have been designed, which are based on the society of mind idea, often do have this idea that rewards are decomposed in interesting ways. And they just... But I think a lot of my questions, um, the points raised when we talk about the society of mind uh, systems, or but also sort of in teams and, and the coalition work, I think at the core, we're trying to ask questions about transition. Like what, like how does this trans, how does this transition work? And what should we, what insights we should be taking, um, taking from it as, as we try to engineer these? Yeah, I think that's right. It is that we're, you know, when is, when is a society of mind a mind and not just a society? And you know, when is a mind a society of mind and not just a mind, right? That it's you know those the the characteristics that make the whole more than the sum of the parts is the thing that we're reaching for. They're trying to understand in biology, but biology does that awesomely, and we, we'd like to be able to do that in in artificial systems too, right? And the and the tricky thing is that that there's a it's not just you start off by saying. Well, if I wanted a multi-agent system to do that, I would reward it to do that. You know, oh, wait a minute. What should I be rewarding? Should I be rewarding the individuals for doing that? Or should I be rewarding the whole for doing that? And then that's that's the whole problem. That's exactly the whole problem. And then it becomes, you know, as I sort of highlighted, often what we'll do that we'll formulate these systems and we'll have some underlying objectives. So we're optimizing something. And it's not obvious that we're optimizing the right thing, though that's going to change the entire way that we design the system. So, uh, thank you. We have some comments and um, and questions. So, Jonathan Stray has a suggestion that there is a lot of resonance between the biological question of what is an individual and the concept of Cartesian frames in AI alignment theory. Jonathan, would you like to say uh, some more about this and um, ask our and then our our speakers can comment? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so AI alignment is a, um, a, I guess at this point, largely theoretical uh, pursuit, which asks how can we create agents which uh, provably align to human values? Um, and it's, it's intensely mathematical. And one of the abstractions that has come out of that field is this thing called the Cartesian frame. And what that is, is it's a partition of the universe into an agent and an environment. And it acknowledges that that partition is um, inherently unstable that the agent and the environment are duels. Um, you, it tells you what happens when you start to play around with the boundaries. Um, and it has um, some formalisms for looking at subtypes. So I don't know directly how to apply uh, this formalism to some of these problems, but I do think it's a very interesting way of thinking that has emerged in um, a much more abstract setting. Yeah, interesting. So that Cartesian cut is also applied in in orthodox approaches to the biology too right to separate from organism and environment and i know where the organism is and i know where the environment is and they're not the same thing uh, and we sort of often take that stance when we set up an agent system now here's the agent and here's the environment and i know what the difference is and i know where the boundary is but in the transitions and in individuality that's exactly the thing that you don't know because the environment includes other agents and when agents interact with that other agent in some particular ways, it's now 
wait a minute, is now not even part of the environment anymore. It's part of us. We've become a thing uh, that we've moved the boundary of, of where that cut was between the, the agent and its environment. It's now become taken inside the, uh, inside the remit of the thing that's being rewarded for behaving. Yeah, yeah, I think I think the Cartesian frame theory is nice because it has something to say about it says the Cartesian cut is a point of view, not a fact of the universe. And so it gives you a little machinery for for attacking these problems. That sounds right. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. So we have a question uh, from Morgan for Richard. Uh, is this any different from a collective action problem? Can you say more about a collective action problem? Um, yeah. Maybe Morgan can, go ahead. Sorry, I don't wanna gobble up too much time. This was just in reference to your description of the relationship between the fitness of the parts and the fitness of the whole. Um, I was wondering if that's similar to the social science concept of a collection act, collective action problem where two agents can do better by cooperating than going alone but one agent can do even better than that by defecting when the other agent tries to cooperate. Yeah, that's exactly the problem that we're talking about. So there, you know, in the social context, we're talking about agents that are, uh, are making choices in a strategy space, but the game that they're in has that kind of coordination game kind of properly, but with opportunities to defect. Uh, and in the evolutionary realm, we're talking about a fitness function that has interactions that have the same kind of properties. And there's a tendency for the individuals to defect if they, if you didn't take control of the self-interest, then they would undermine the individuality of the whole. Yeah, it's the same problem. And in order, in order for the uh, collective to have characteristics that you can not reasonably say, well, that characteristic belongs to the whole rather than the sum of the parts. Um, there, it needs to be uh, an action that you can describe as being a collective action rather than the, the collective action produces variability that belongs to that uh, holistic scale rather than changing individual actions, which belongs to the um, component scale. Uh, thanks very much. So we have a question from Jillian, and it relates to uh, yesterday's session. She says, in yesterday's session, uh, artificial and natural social learning, we ended on the point that human social learning includes changing the goals of the members of a group. Now, is that the kind of plasticity Richard is talking about, that individual agents interact and reshape their goals, and representations then structure future behavior? Um, is there some commonality here? Uh, I think that's probably correct, yes. So when you have a uh, when you have a response to hmm, how can you tell the difference between a system that's just changing its behavior in order to satisfy its goals, but its goals didn't change, and an agent that changed its goals, right? And so it has this sort of meta sort of feeling to it, doesn't it? Uh, but, it, you know, in computer science, we understand that there isn't really a distinction between program and data, right? That, the, you know, there, there isn't really a difference between me just running a program and me changing the program that I'm running. And so, you know, whenever you have components that interact with one another in complex nonlinear ways, it's actually equivalent to changing the game that they're playing, um, or can be. Um, but I think that it's, it's sometimes useful to think about it as a metagame. Um, and you know, those are the cases which are interesting. I don't know if Kate has thoughts there. Well, I don't think I have anything, you know, particularly intelligent to say about this, but I think it's a sort of a fascinating idea. And it is, you know, this idea that we have these agents who are, you know, playing a game, which is actually part of a metagame. And then, yeah, I think it's sort of, you know, fascinating to understand what the ramifications of that is. And, you know, what these different trajectories, you know, what are the different possible metagames that the agents might be playing and how can we shape or, you know, our systems so that we end up kind of in good outcomes. We end up playing kind of the right metagames for some definition of right. Hmm. 
And Taylor and Novak have this work where they talk about changing the spatial structure, interaction structure, playing the prisoner's dilemma, right? And they point out that playing the prisoner's dilemma in one spatial structure changes what the equilibria are of the game from another spatial structure. And that means that, oh, wait a minute, the new equilibria that it has, that's equivalent to a different kind of game. Yeah. So changing who interacts with who is the same as changing the game that they were playing. So you can sort of incorporate that thing. Well, if I have strategies that change interaction structure, that's a metagame now, right? And now I'm changing the game that I'm playing, right? So I, I think that you can, I think there's territory there, which is useful to think about in that way. Right, thanks very much. Uh, here's a question from Gillian for Kate. Um, how would we build artificial agents without fixed objectives, with learned objectives? I think that actually goes back to this metagame idea. Okay, good. I think, I think, I think, um, uh, yeah, so how, so how do you do that? So you need sort of a, you know, I, I'm, I, I don't know. I think it's a fascinating problem, right? But very much there's this recognition that um, agents have to be playing kind of in a metagame, um, possibly where some of these agents are, you know, outside kind of the, these local interactions. Um, yeah, I wish I knew. I think this is fascinating. Yep. How do you get sort of what happens when you have evolving objectives? Has this changed sort of the learning processes of the agents or what does it mean in terms of the outcomes that arise? What are the strategies that are going to uh, be playing? How is this going to shape sort of behavior and what outcomes you can support? I think really, really fascinating questions. I, I, don't, I don't know how, how you would do that though. And as Jillian says, that gives us more to talk about next year. <laughs> Nicole, we have just enough time for one more question. Would you like to ask it? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, Kate, I saw on your slides, you briefly mentioned uh, that a small amount of self-interest uh, yeah. would help improve cooperation in teams. And I was wondering if you could briefly uh, go over that. Yeah, so we've been exploring the idea of um, sort of whether we can get kind of system wide cooperation if we have teams of agents as opposed to sort of, you know, completely, you know, individual self interested agents or a fully cooperative system. And our, you know, and for, for reinforcement learning, so we have multi agent reinforcement learning, so we have these teams of um, reinforcement learning agents. And we've been experimenting across a variety of different social temporally extended social dilemmas. And our first results were that there was strong benefit of um, working with smaller teams. So having agents kind of, you know, be inclined to have the incentives that they're inclined to cooperate with a, sm with a smaller subgroup that get, improves the learning, it um, speeds it up, they get specializations or things work quite nicely. But our argument is that, you know, not every situation you're going to have your individuals are fully team focused like you know i'm a team member and that's all that i really care about is sort of the, the benefit of the team instead there will often be situations where you have a, a little bit of self-interest so my phd student in question who looks at these sorts of problems is a very very good hockey player and so you know talks a lot about sort of team dynamics and about how you're all for the team but you know you score the goal that's like a little bit of an extra bonus so there is some self-interest there and so we've explored ideas about how we could sort of parameterize our agents so that they, you know, they're good team members, but they would like to shine themselves through the way that we can maybe structure reward or sort of um, in the system. And what we've been able to find is that just a little bit of, self, even just a little bit of self-interest actually still supports kind of good cooperative behavior. Um, both inside the teams as well as across the entire system, and then also sort of boost performance when we talk about mean reward overall. Well, thank you very much. We um, seem to have resolved all the questions about how evolutionary theory can inform multiple agent AI and the other way around, just in time to pass the session over to the next group of people. But before we do that, I want to thank our speakers very, very much. It was really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun.